Hello, everybody, and welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. I'm Jeff Edwards. I work for the University of Wyoming Extension in Goshen County, which is in the southeast corner of Wyoming. Jeremiah Vardaman is my co-host today. Good morning, Jeremiah. How are you doing morning. today? Doing well. Yourself? Very good. Good to see you. Um, you too. Jeremiah also works for the University of Wyoming Extension, and he is located up in the northern part of the state, in Powell, Cody area. And before I move on to our guest, I need to mention Jenny Thompson. She's a specialist for the University of Wyoming. You uh, may not see her today, but uh, you might hear her. She may throw uh, questions our way for our guest. Uh, and our guest today is Scott Shell. He is the extension entomologist for the University of Wyoming. And um, Scott, you know, uh, uh, being an entomologist, you get a lot of interesting questions. We talk a lot about a, a, a lot of interesting topics. So um, uh, it seems like we mention insects at least once or twice during uh, each uh, program. So, but before, but before they, we, oh, but sorry. before we get to you, <laughs> um, a couple of things to keep track of. Uh, if those of you are using Zoom to join us. Uh, there's a Q and a if you scroll your mouse over the top of zoom there's a q and a button at the bottom if you would like to ask questions please use that format or the chat format in zoom and for those of you who are joining us via Facebook if you have questions or comments for us please use the uh, comment area in Facebook and uh, Jenny will push those uh, questions and comments uh, forward to us as we go along so once again Scott did I, did I get everything, Jeremiah? Well, I guess one thing we, we want to mention is usually with insects, there's a lot of questions that come our way, and we have specific insects we're going to try and cover through the show. And so if we don't get to your specific insect or your specific question, we're going to have detailed information uh, on how to co contact Scott directly at the end of the show. And so you can get those questions and hopefully uh, pictures are always nice. Good pictures um, help us really answer those questions for you. So, but with that, yeah, let's turn it over. Let's talk about some insects, uh, Scott. All right. Thanks, Jeremiah. And thanks, Jeff uh, and Jenny for having me on. Uh, I'm, I'm always willing to talk about insects. Let me see if I can get my screen shared and get my presentation going here for a second. Uh, so get that up there. And yeah, it's at least to me, it's amazing being in my position. How many times I get to converse with Scott on a weekly basis, at least it seems like about insects. And, and most of the time it's like, Scott, what the heck is this? Uh, <laughs> or have you heard anything of this? Right. But good questions and good information on that pest really helps us answer those questions. Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, I. I tell people, uh, you know, the highlight of my day usually are is like looking at my emails, uh, getting uh, emails with uh, photos, or uh, even now uh, on my smartphone, uh, I'll have people sending me photos asking me what is this, and and it's very satisfying if I can give them an answer. Uh, and in some cases, I have to to reach out to other people for help, but. Definitely, uh, yeah, that's the highlight of my day. I'm uh, uh, well suited because I love insects. That's, <laughs> there, there's, it's, those are usually two-parter questions, right? What is this and is it going to hurt me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the big thing is, is sometimes uh, I, I love it when people reach out to me and say, what is this before they've done any kind of treatment or control because in many cases, uh, you know, the vast majority of insects, and it's been estimated like 99.9% .9 of all species of insects are harmless, or beneficial, or innocuous. We don't know what they do. You know, that tenth of a percent of the different species can be very numerous and very uh, uh, harmful to gardens or, you know, annoying like a bed bug or, or a yellow jacket wasp, but certainly that is, uh, you know, uh, like say a lot of times people recognize those common pests it's the uncommon things that are, are good to, to cover so I today you know we're going to talk about common insect issues in our gardens and yards and I'm assuming it is is, is my first slide up uh, yeah that, you're good right? <clears throat> so let's see here if I can get it to advance um, in the lead up to this program there was a, a question about uh, western ca caterpillars 
and uh, I have seen a few this spring. I've uh, pulled a couple of the webs off my current bush, and I think I got one off a Canadian red cherry tree that I had the other day. And and you know the one thing I want to emphasize about this particular creature is uh, uh, don't prune your tree unless you want to get rid of that branch. Uh, there's no necessity to do that. There's other ways to remove them, uh, which doesn't hurt the tree. Essentially, uh, these insects are native. Uh, their population seems to go in cycles and uh, they will do defoliation. This picture here is one that I got from uh, uh, Dave Letterman, who is with the Colorado State Forest Service. It was an aspen grove that was uh, really spectacularly infested. I guess that's what an <laughs> entomologist would say, wow, look at that. Uh, if that was your tree, you wouldn't be too happy with it. And so uh, this is what the little moths look like. A lot of times people don't know what they look like. They're not real uh, showy and they're nocturnal. And uh, uh, they appear uh, in midsummer after the caterpillars, of course, pupate and change into the adult form and go around and lay very, uh, uh, inconspicuous egg masses on the trees and essentially then those egg masses overwinter and, and so they only have one generation a year. So uh, trees and shrubs they can be defoliated once if they're otherwise healthy. They'll put on a new set of leaves by midsummer and uh, that, that was the thing that Dave Leatherman pointed out in this photo is that he'd taken it and then he wanted to show his boss and he may come back you know about five weeks later and He's going, well, what, you know, the, the, the trees that we leave. And, and so the caterpillars, uh, hairy little boogers, but they don't have the irritating hairs. And, and so uh, I, you know, I'm a little squeamish. I put on a glove usually to wipe them off. Uh, if, you, if you have a big tree and you can't get to it all, you can utilize uh, various kinds of uh, insecticides, whether it's organic, or, or uh, synthetic uh, that are labeled for leaf feeding caterpillars on the type of tree that you have. If it's a you know ornamental tree, there's more products out there. If it's a fruit bearing tree, like you know if you're if you're going to harvest choke cherries off of them, uh, you know that is uh, one that they'll hit. Uh, you you want to make sure your product is labeled for that use and and uh, apply it accordingly. Right. So I got a question, Scott. Um, uh -huh. It sounds like this is not a host specific insect pest. And, and if you can talk about that, uh, what host specific is, and then with this Western tent caterpillar, is there any vegetation that they don't utilize? Uh, well, uh, yeah, they're a fairly broad host uh, with uh, broadleaf plants, uh, uh, trees and shrubs. Uh, Never seen them on conifers, uh, but I've seen them on uh, the uh, mountain mahogany and aspen, and currant and wax currant, and uh, you know the choke cherries. Uh, uh, you know, there's probably uh, flowering plum. I've had them on uh, flowering plum. Um, so uh, definitely uh, things. You know, that's probably one of the things that gets people's attention is because in some cases they are on fruit bearing. Uh, trees or shrubs, you know, like choke cherries. Uh, uh, and, and so that, that makes a big difference. There are some insects that are very specific, of course, that, you know, they only eat uh, mm -hmm. you know, leaves of uh, plants, say, that are in the rose uh, family. Uh, so that's a good Great. question. Scott, are these the only um, tent type caterpillars that we have in Wyoming? No, uh, we do have uh, a couple other species that will form the webs, uh, uh, the uh, fall webworm, and then uh, I think, what is it, um, it's the common name, messy nest, or uh, it, it's one, they, they, they get a lot of uh, leaf debris in, in, in the okay. webs, so, uh, but western tent caterpillar is definitely uh, the most common and this is the time of year when you start to see those webs uh, expand. And, and the, why they do that is it provides them some physical protection from predators uh, and, and shelters them from storms. And uh, when they get older and they get about ready to transform into the adult stage, they'll disperse off the plant and abandon that. that and, and you mentioned that these are a hairy 
species, and you said that these didn't have the irritating hairs that some caterpillars do. Can you, I know this is kind of a rabbit hole, but there are some uh, caterpillar, caterpillar species that have uh, irritating hairs. Can you talk about that a little bit more before we move on? Sure. Uh, uh, probably uh, one, one that I know occurs in Wyoming that has highly irritating hairs is Douglas fir tussock moth. And so you don't want to handle uh, them. Uh, it's a defense mechanism against predation. Uh, uh, and so the, those are called urticating hairs. And uh, so they can penetrate your skin and, and they uh, have uh, chemicals on them that are, are particularly irritating uh, and can cause rashes. Uh, and so I, I'm always of uh, the opinion on insects is if I don't know for sure, I'm not going to handle them bare skin. That's uh, uh, a, a cautious attitude towards insects is always best. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's like say on these particular ones, I'm sure, you know, if you look at one of these uh, little hairy caterpillars, uh, if you're a bird, uh, you know, it might, you know, it'd be, it'll tickle my throat if I eat it. Uh, so I'm certain that that's, uh, or it could be a way of mimicry, you know, that, that maybe a bird has tried to eat Douglas fir tussock moth and had a bad experience. And it's like, ooh, this is hairy too. I'm not going to touch it. Many, in many cases, there's uh, what's called mimicry where uh, perfectly harmless edible insects will mimic insects that can either sting uh, like a wasp, uh, uh, you know, yellow jackets with their black and yellow warning coloration or taste bad like uh, lady beetles with their, uh, they have a, a bad tasting uh, of blood. So, right. So, a question on this western tent caterpillar, Scott. Just uh, so the they form this silk, what are called the tents, the silk webbing in, in trees or shrubs. And now that's the caterpillar that's actually doing that. Is that the pupation? Uh, are they going through pupation? What are they doing in that tent caterpillar or in the tents? And then, uh, what stage of life cycle is that? And then for the control that you said of those. Uh, rubbing them off or anything like that. When do I need to be doing that? The uh, uh, they start off, they hatch together, and they'll feed in the immediate area, and they can produce silk like many of the uh, larvae of uh, moths and butterflies, and and so they they make this tent, and it keeps expanding as they get older, and they won't leave that tent until they get to their last stage uh, ready to pupate and then they disperse and go away from it to uh, actually uh, form their uh, uh, cocoon and and then do the transformation in the adult stage and so the uh, my understanding is they they do most of their feeding uh, in the evening and so they will disperse sometimes you'll see them on a cool day they'll be on the outside of the tent all gathered in a mass and if you if you poke at them they'll start twitching, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it probably, you know, uh, maybe it discourages some predators. Uh, I'm assuming that that's it. They, you know, so they're bunched up and they're on top of that sticky silk web uh, that would also uh, probably discourage some birds because if you try to get, you know, them out of that, they'll get that sticky silk on their beak. That uh, uh, twitching behavior also discourages squeamish humans. <laughs> say, it and makes you scream entertaining. like a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, and and so that's why you know you can put. Uh, actually, I mean, there's some of the labeled insecticides you could apply it to the tent directly, but uh, other things you know, such as uh, uh, Dipel, which is uh, uh, BT Kerstaki. It's a, a it can be an organic formulation, but it's actually a, a, a bacterium. It's similar to the product you use for mosquitoes, only this is the Kerstaki uh, variety. And so it's effective against the caterpillars or butterflies and moths, and they have to eat it. And so if you spray it on the tent, they're not eating that tent. Uh, you need to spray it on the leaves around the tent because they'll disperse at night and chew on that. And that's why they, they keep expanding that tent as they go and get bigger. And, and uh, you know, kind of encapsulate those leaves and branches in the silk as they, they feed. So, uh, like I said, it, it kind of 
you know, you want to uh, you know, read your label on how they recommend applying a product, whether uh, it's or, uh, you know, any kind of product, whether it's organic or synthetic, uh, to make sure it's effective and, and targets your pest. Great. Well, and, and the, the names that you're using for these insecticides are the active ingredients uh, of those, correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, the, uh, I think the Dietel is actually a brand name, but you know, we, uh, we try to just give active ingredients because in some cases uh, there might be multiple brands of, of product that has those actives and, and you know, we try to encourage people to read the labels, you know, read, make sure uh, and not just look uh, at the pictures, you know, because uh, uh, some people say, well, it had this picture of the bug on the label and, and usually that implies that it works, but it, it's uh, not necessary. It's, you, you always want to read those labels. Right. <laughs> Definitely read those labels. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's our next, what's our next insect? Uh, the root weevils. So actually it's multiple ones because, you know, we refer to them as root weevils, but we have uh, black vine weevil, lilac root weevil, rough root weevil, and strawberry root weevil uh, are all found in Wyoming. I would say probably uh, if you've got uh, an established lilac hedge and you live in a town in Wyoming, you probably have noticed notching on the edges of the leaves and you probably have lilac root weevil or black pine weevil uh, established there. So why are they called root weevils if there's notching on the leaves? <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. kind of seems like an oxymoron to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's because they spend most of their life uh, as larvae feeding on the roots of suitable host plants. And so, uh, again, that's, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. So yeah. that's what the, the immature stage looks like. And, and uh, you know, they start out little, of course, and they'll feed on root hairs and, and actually can uh, severely damage uh, the roots. Now, if you have a big established lilac hedge with a good root system already going, they can, you know, withstand that root pruning. But if you put a transplant of something that's susceptible to them nearby, then it has a limited root system anyway. And if it gets these weevils, uh, larva uh, chewing on them, uh, it can really you know, end up killing the plant or stunning it. Uh, so uh, you know, definitely this is a, a, a pest that's very common, uh, but often goes unnoticed because the adults, when they're actually doing the notching on the edges of the leaves, are uh, nocturnal. Uh, people are more likely to see them like Jenny Thompson does uh, invading her house when it gets uh, when when the adults are out active and out you know into their house. Yeah, they love my bathtub. I'll see them crawling <laughs> around the walls, but they really like the bathtub. <laughs> That's very pleasant. <laughs> swimming with swimming with the beetles. <laughs> <laughs> so Scott. Um, with that root pruning, especially on established lilacs, right, they're a robust lilac, they can tolerate some of that root pruning and not really significantly injure them. Will that weaken that bush or, or tree to a point where they, and, and possibly open up the susceptibility of those, those bushes to maybe other diseases to come in? Oh yeah, yeah, you know, any kind of root uh, injury is much more serious than leaf injury. Because you got to always remember, like the leaves on deciduous plants, that's just tissue that's shed at the end of the season. And whereas the roots are, you know, they, they keep growing and, and they're what the plant depends on, uh, you know, for the, to store the food, uh, to gather uh, water, which is so important in Wyoming uh, situations and, and other nutrients from the soil. So, yeah, the root damage is, is the much more serious uh, problem with these particular pests. So the larva is, is more significant to be concerned about than the actual adults themselves. So how do we, how do we know if we have larva and how do we control them? Well, if you've got the notching going on on your plants uh, starting at about this time of year, then you know that uh, they will start producing you know, offspring and the population will just get bigger in the next year. So uh, there is, we have a pretty good bulletin on them. It's a little out of date. Uh, when we wrote it, uh, we included uh, 
things about the life cycle and when it's best to apply uh, treatments. Uh, we include things like parasitic parasitic nematodes that can be applied that will attack the larva in the soil. Uh, uh, we didn't include uh, some of the systemic insecticides that are now available in homeowner formulations that uh, are effective uh, controls that can be applied uh, to the soil as a drench uh, to uh, uh, treat these things. Uh, I, I really don't think that applying uh, the insecticides to the leaves for the adults uh, is, you know, really a, a cost-effective treatment. You know, I don't think you're going to get a high enough level of control to really reduce reduce uh, the uh, population. Uh, uh, I, uh, and, and of course, you know, you're also exposing more of your beneficials because, you know, like I said, they're only coming out at night to feed uh, on the leaf edges and then going back into like the leaf litter and, and debris under the plants to hide during the day. And so it, it could be, uh, like I said, I, I prefer to apply systemic insecticide and I try to apply it so uh, there is either post bloom or uh, the systemic would be at its low ebb when the uh, flowers are, are there to reduce exposure to uh, pollinators. Uh, and, and so that's uh, you know, kind of the way I do it. I, I've got these in my landscape. I've suppressed them. I have not eliminated them. Uh, and I've found things like currants. Uh, they don't seem to be a, a, a in their host range. And I don't, uh, at, least, hmm. at least the current I've got uh, I've transplanted around and I've had good success with things in the So Scott, when folks tell me they have notches in their leaves, I always ask them some more questions because um, my understanding is one of the bees makes notches in leaves kind of as well. Can you talk about that and talk about how you tell the difference? Yeah, uh, I backed up a slide. Uh, leaf cutter bees will utilize leaf cashew and they also they come in really fast and they cut out uh, either uh, kind of uh, perfect circles and that makes the end cap of the little containers they make for their larva and then they make the rest of the container with ovals of leaf tissue and of course they like things like uh, uh, roses, uh, lilac leaves often get these things and so their, their uh, uh, cutouts are much bigger uh, on their uh, the, the root weevils make these little kind of square edge uh, notches in the leaves. Uh, you can see here on these peonies, they also like those a lot. So the, yeah, that's, uh, I, I should have included that picture too, because there is, uh, you often, they, the leaf cutter bees do it so fast, people often don't associate, you know, like what is doing that to my plant? Well, and at least for me, the leaf cutter bee notches seem to be more characteristic to me like if somebody took a hole punch a single hole punch out there and just punched holes in the leaves they're they're almost perfectly circle on most of them and then others are just a slight oblong shape and so yeah they're they're definitely different than here so not all notching on the leaves even if it's on a lilac is not a, necessarily a root weevil and so we got to identify that pest correctly before we make our applications, right? Yeah, and in most cases, I, I, I recommend people give leaf cutters the pass on, you know, it's like uh, most plants have excess leaf tissue. And, and so if your plant is otherwise unspecialed and growing vigorously, having those, those uh, notches cut out, you know, I guess aesthetically it maybe damages a little bit, but leaf cutter bees are, are uh, beneficial pollinators. In, in uh, the Bighorn Basin, where they grow a lot of alfalfa uh, for seed production, you know, they, they, they utilize them. Uh, specifically, uh, the alfalfa leaf cutter bee, that, that particular species for that. And so you don't want to be uh, killing leaf cutter bees. Um, I've, I've tried to figure out if there's a sacrificial perennial uh, or annual plant that can be planted to protect perennials. Uh, and I had a candidate and I, uh, a lady was going to try it uh, and then she decided she'd just get rid of her service berry bush instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's, tough. That's the other way to do it. <laughs> yeah. We got a question here on, from Facebook, uh, Scott. Dan asked, do root weevils affect most deciduous or coniferous trees or just shrubs and garden plants? What, what is kind of that host range? Where do you see it? Well, uh, 
from my understanding, uh, they uh, do not feed on the leaves of conifers, but they can feed on the roots of some conifers. Uh, and then, like say in our yards, uh, I commonly see them uh, on on trees and shrubs. But there are, uh, you know, uh, peonies uh, will be uh, their their leaves are at least attacked by them. Um, so I, I would guess it, you have to uh, take it on a case by case basis. Like say, I have a black currant, and it seems to have thrived, and I never see any notching on its leaves. So. Uh, well, and it probably depends on the species of root weevil, correct? So like the lilac root weevil primarily feeds upon lilacs, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure how, how specific it is, if it's within a, a, a family for these different species. And then, you know, like the strawberry root weevil, it probably got its name because it was attacking the roots of strawberry plants primarily. But I'm sure, you know, strawberries related to other uh, you know, plants, that, and so they could be... Uh, vulnerable too. Not, you know, they don't attack grasses, but uh, definitely, you know, any, uh, I'm not sure if it has been defined as far as all of them, and then whether the feeding is all that serious on all of them too, because there are some of them might, have, maybe the plant can mount a defense against the feeding. Well, sure. it sounds like most of the feeding is on perennial plants because they have a more extensive root system. So most of our garden plants, I'm thinking vegetables and, and, and the like, are annual plants. And they're not going to have the root system mass, for one, but also um, it's going to be growing throughout the year. So it's And you're uh, usually removing that root mass over time. And so it's not going to benefit this type of, of pest. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I would say that they're not an issue for any kind of annuals uh, and you know, uh, root vegetables or anything like that. It's more, uh, I'd say, perennial trees and shrubs, things that uh, you know, persist for several years. And so then the uh, root damage can accumulate in time and hurt the plant. Right. Well, what's our next pest? I was going to talk about aphids. Uh, certainly aphids are, are pretty ubiquitous uh, uh, garden pests, uh, also in landscapes. And, and you know, we term them as aphids, uh, lump them all together, but there's over 1,300 species. And then you, you, when you start delving into them, uh, it becomes important to identify what aphids you have on what particular plant, you know, if you're seeing uh, issues on that plant because uh, then that can help you um, perhaps manage the aphid pest better because uh, our uh, next slide, the uh, green peach aphid is one a good example of a two host aphid. It has a winter host and a summer host. And so if we look at their life cycle as such, they overwinter on the buds of uh, like stone fruit is uh, their favorite, uh, things uh, that have uh, a pit, you know, so uh, peaches and nectarines and those types of things. Plums. Uh, yeah, plums. Uh, and, and so then uh, they hatch and then they can form, uh, uh, after feeding for a generation or two, they form a winged uh, uh, generation. And then they can move into, uh, you know, like uh, fields. Uh, potatoes are one that's uh, often hit by the green peach aphid. Uh, and then uh, the winged mothers will come there and lay uh, uh, a, a start a generation of offspring that are wingless. And those offspring, they reproduce parthenogenically. And so that without uh, you know, sexual interaction, they just make little clones of themselves. And this picture here shows this is a, a, a green peach aphid giving birth to live birth to uh, uh, young and uh, it, they've found that uh, they'll actually be the next generation already farming in this live birth. Thing. And so really a high rate of reproduction. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, the other thing about aphids is you know, they feed, they have a little beak and they feed on the flow or, or, or the sap of the plants. And, and so they aren't removing leaf tissue, they're removing the, the, the sap and they can create water stress, and they also, uh, because they have to 
uh, suck so much of that to get enough nutrients, they also excrete a lot of it that still contains some of the sugars, and then that can create problems with uh, mildew and, and stuff like that on your plants. So again, there are some uh, aphids that uh, don't have this uh, multi-host cycle. They'll live only on one of the plants. Uh, I had a, a submission, uh, it, was, it was kind of unusual. It was uh, off of a, a beans in a, in a garden and uh, they were not doing well and they submitted the whole plant like you should and examined the roots and they had root aphids. And so I was trying to figure out, well, what, what aphids attack the roots of beans? And so uh, there is a bean root aphid and when I looked it up and it's like, oh yeah, this is what it is. But then I looked at its life cycle and where it came from originally uh, near the Mediterranean, it was a two host life cycle. Uh, oh. Now it lacks the, the winter host. So it just stays as a root aphid forever, you know, in, in the U.S. And so uh, they're, they're flexible. Uh, uh, but again, it's good to know specifically what you got and then uh, try to tailor your control, uh, maybe interrupt the life cycle. Uh, so kind of a long-winded answer. But yeah, aphids are pretty ubiquitous uh, pests. Uh, many times it's not just their fluid feeding. They can vector uh, diseases. They can cause leaves to curl, and you know they're not very hardy insects, and that provides them shelter. Uh, you know, if you get uh, like in lots of Wyoming, in the older parts of town, you've got these big cottonwood trees, and you get a hot, dry summer without many thunderstorms, you get a huge explosion of the uh, uh, aphids that live on those things. And so, you know, if you uh, park your car underneath one of those trees, by the end of the day, it looks like a glazed donut, because that's all honeydew coming down on it and drying on it so <laughs> so honeydew is one one symptom or one indicator of of possible aphids in, on a plant or in a tree well again uh, uh you know you can because they're pretty small for the most part you know you need to examine the leaves uh, on the the ones up in the cottonwood trees often be in the upper canopy so you can't see them but what you will see is uh the evidence of the uh honeydew raining down or uh, evidence from previous years of the uh, uh, black mildew that has grown on top of the branches that are down low so that the honeydew rains down accumulates on the bark and then you get that black uh, mildew coloration on there so, uh, and you said there's 1300 species of aphids and id is is what you need to work on how do I ID an aphid? <laughs> well, that's uh, 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 the way you can do it is a lot of the plant uh, hosts uh, have been worked out. So if you know what plant is being affected, you can eliminate a huge percentage of those species. You know, there are some of the species that occur that, you know, are out in, on, you know, the wild native plants and, and they generally, uh, you know, maybe their populations go up and down, but we don't pay any attention to them. It's the ones in our yards or gardens or crops that we pay attention to. And so that, that, that helps. I mean, essentially, I, I, I think, it, you know, we do have 1,300 species, but I, of those, you know, we probably only have major pest problems with 50. I, okay. so yeah. You you talked a little bit about their life cycle. Did you talk about the reproductive strategy? How um, odd how odd that might be for insects? Well, no, not really. I uh, you know other. I, than, I don't know if you want to touch on that or not, but uh, some some folks might find it interesting. I don't know. The other entomologists in the room is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. well, well, like I said on 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 some of them, uh, you know, here's one for you. Uh, it would be the Russian weeded. Now, that, that common name always bothered uh, my old boss and friend, uh, Professor Alex Lachininsky, because he was from Russia, and he said, that's not a Russian aphid, it's the barley aphid in Russia, because that was its preferred host, although it attacks other uh, small grain crops. And so in the U.S., uh, it, it was introduced and became a, a, a pest of small grains, and uh, but no males of the Russian wheat aphid were ever found in North America. Uh, 
Uh, and so it's all by uh, uh, this essentially cloning, parthenogenesis, where they can reproduce themselves uh, without sex. Now, you have other species like green pea chafer, where they will have, uh, at the end of the season, when they produce the overwintering eggs, uh, will have, uh, you know, uh, produce males and then uh, have mating going on. Uh, certainly, you know, like say on some of these uh, aphids, uh, up to 18 generations, uh, you know, in a growing season. So tremendous numbers. And so that's why they supported tremendous numbers of, of uh, uh, predators. And uh, so that's what we can talk about next is um, the lady beetle larva. Well, hold on, hold on a bit, Scott. <laughs> we got we got a few questions. Got to hold you up there. Back on okay. aphids. So okay. the the reason that that sexual or or the way they they multiply and reproduce, that's why they can go from not a problem to an infestation level so quickly, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, it, it it goes into that uh, you know exponential growth type of thing where it's like, well, one aphid uh, produces you know, one offspring. Uh, and she's already forming uh, and grows uh, or, or the next generation in her and and you know then she and and her daughter have another set and, and, and then it goes you know it's like two four eight sixteen thirty two sixty four and so on tremendous numbers of of offspring in a very short period of time and so yeah, that's just why, that exponential growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's, that's, uh, that's why scouting is so important to get out there, you know, uh, get out in the garden, watch your plants grow and also look for potential pests. So our, we have a question from Cheryl on Facebook that says last spring, there were aphids on the honeysuckle bushes completely distorted the new growth. Are honeysuckles just prone to infestations? And I would, I kind of expand that question to what other plants do I need to be concerned about with aphids? Hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, like I said, you know, with that, so many species of aphids that just about every plant can get them, you know, it's like you know, uh, willows, the giant willow aphid can show up. Mm. Uh, it, 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 and that, that's the other thing too, uh, with people, uh, you know, that wing generation, you can be not a bit of, you know, no sign of aphids, and you go out the next day and you've got aphids on your plants. And, and so they can travel long distances in the air. Uh, uh, you can kind of think of it as almost like plankton floating in the ocean. You know, they can't really, they're not powerful flyers, but they can get up and ride wings. Um, last summer, I uh, was walking toward my barn on a, a sunny spring day, and so the, the barn entrance looked really dark, and it was like, is it spitting? It's like it looked like it was spitting sleep or something. Really fine things. And I went over and and was looking closer, and it was aphids and flea beetles raining down. You know, not real heavy. It wasn't like I was going to have an inch of them at the end of the day, but it was just all of a sudden I had these uh, creatures floating down midair. You so, don't have to have an inch of them. One or two of them is a problem, can be a problem yeah. really fast. Yeah, so exactly. aphids are just, yeah, they're pro prolific and they, they attack all kinds of plants. So how do we control them? Yeah, yeah that's a, a good question. Certainly uh, that leads into the next topic about uh, there's a, a lot of insects that uh, prey on them. Uh, and, and so uh, you know, many people recognize the lady beetles or ladybird beetles or lady bugs. I prefer lady beetle because that's more accurate because they're not a bug. Uh, uh, and and uh, but people often don't recognize the larval forms of them, and they kind of look like little alligators. And this is just this is a seven-spotted lady beetle as an example. It's a fairly uh, common one, um, uh, and it's surrounded by potential prey here. And it, if you have an abundance of aphids and you, you can get an abundance of these and they wander around, crawl around, and they can uh, sometimes end up in places where you don't want them. Uh, you know, a lot of times people might have a deck and say, they, uh, last time I had this happen, they had a willow tree over the top of the deck and uh, lady beetle larva were falling down on the deck and they're predators and they've got chewing mouth parts and they were probably getting hungry because there was no aphids on the people so they would you know, maybe bite them and 
And so uh, it's, it's good to uh, you know, educate people on what the different stages look like. This is the, the stage when they change into the adult. So they'll be uh, inactive as they change their body form from this guy to this guy. So you, you've got predators like lady beetle larva that uh, work on them. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we always think of the orange or black spots or lady beetles, but uh, there's actually many different species of lady beetles. Some of them are uh, more of a specialist on things to say like scale insects and stuff like that. So it's always good to, to uh, check uh, before you spray to make sure that instead of a leaf beetle, uh, you're not uh, treating, uh, say, a beneficial lady beetle. This is a cool website. Uh, from the University of South Dakota. Uh, uh, they call it the Lost Ladybug uh, Organization because uh, many of our uh, native species of ladybugs or lady beetles uh, are in decline. So lady, lady beetles could be one control method on aphids and you can actually order them from in some insectatories that raise them and sell them for gardens and that so uh but so they're uh, one option for control for aphids yeah well actually i i think jeff can correct me if i'm wrong but i think most of the ones that are sold by the uh, uh companies are the convergent lady beetles that are gathered uh from places where they like in, in the Central Valley of California, uh, uh, when it gets hot and dry and the uh, aphid populations drop, the, the convergent lady beetles go up into the mountains, the foothills, and gather in masks and, and can be collected in buckets and then sold. It's, and it's this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's this one. <laughs> yeah. That, so, that, that's the convergent lady beetle. Yeah, yeah you're right, though. They, it is the primary one that is sold um, commercially. And, and so they, you know, they uh, are a broad spectrum predators of, of aphids and other soft-bodied insects. Uh, the thing, you know, that's part of, it goes back to that lost lady beetle uh, project is that uh, in many cases, you know, we have brought over uh, non-native or either introduced them on purpose or accidentally. And uh, then you have competition be between native species and uh, the uh, introduced species. And in some cases, you know, when two lady beetle larvae meet, uh, usually the bigger one eats the smaller one. Uh, this is the, the uh, so you can have suppression. So if you bring in a bigger species, or in the case of the notorious multicolored Asian lady beetle, um, uh, it, uh, if it's a smaller one and meets a native uh, larva that is bigger and it eats it, it dies because they've figured out that the, the multicolored Asian lady beetle has these uh, symbiotic uh, bacteria in their hemolymph that uh, essentially are poisonous to our native lady beetle larvae. So, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's always no win. No win world, right? Yeah. So what's Biological your Biological warfare. <laughs> right. So, so uh, this is one you can get uh, from those uh, like biological supply or gardening supply stores, the uh, green and brown lace wings. And I like them because you can get uh, either the eggs or the larva or the adults. Now I recommend getting the eggs and starting out early in the season because when they hatch out, uh, you, you might notice it's kind of interesting. You'll get like a little card with these things uh, stuck to them. The eggs are put on the stalks and they think that's because the first one out would probably eat all these brothers and sisters if they didn't do that. And, and so you can put these out, distribute them out and you know, well, initially they might not be big enough to take on an aphid, but they can take on spider mites or spider mite eggs or other things and then they'll get bigger. And, and they are there in your garden uh, as uh, uh, an, say an aphid problem. It, it's hard to control an aphid problem if they're already abundant and you try to bring in predators. It's best to start early with suppression. And so that's, that's why I recommend these guys. These, uh, uh, they look like little alligators with their big fangs. As Jeff says, they, that, that old uh, Star Trek movie. <laughs> yeah. So 
One of our folks uh, mentioned they had sent in a comment question. They said they have had a lot of issues with aphids in high tunnels. So would this be one of the options for high tunnel control and are there other options they could use? Oh, oh yeah, there's uh, uh, another option that I'll talk about here in a second. But uh, you know, the, the thing about, uh, again, uh, starting early uh, with these particular things, you also need uh, to provide uh, habitat for the adults, and that can be uh, either like uh, uh, you know, things that the adults, you know, like the, the adult lace wings, uh, do a lot of pollen feeding. And so having floral resources within your high tunnel uh, to uh, provide that for the adults if you're going to have a sustaining population, or you can just rely on you know, introductions of the eggs or perhaps larva. Uh, and start early and get them suppressed. Uh, what I mean, you're 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 the guy on the high tunnels, Jeff. You know way more about that than I do. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I don't want to like push my own publication, but I've got one out there that uh, Jenny is going to make available at the end of the program that talks about uh, identifying different insect pests. Oh, there it is, right there, and um, uh, and and being able to use biological control agents and where to get them from. All that information is in this publication. So hopefully folks can find it useful. Uh, Scott, I think you've seen it a couple of times. So oh, yeah, I, I use it all the time, Jeff. It's, it's a good okay. publication. It has a good resources as far as where you can get some of these uh, creatures uh, for uh, you know, biological control. Yeah, and we will have that publication. We'll get that. Uh, we'll share it again here at the end of the show, but we'll also upload that to the website. Um, so you can have a uh, link right to that resource and get it downloaded. Uh, we'll also uh, upload that publication that uh, Scott talked about earlier on the root weevils as well. So we'll have that available for you. What's our next insect pest? Scott? I have to share out again, Scott. Okay. Jenny took control back and then. All right. Yeah, <laughs> made more work for you. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Just tell me what I need to do. Is it back? Okay. Yes. There it is. Okay, this relates back again to uh, uh, more of the beneficials of that can help you deal with aphids. So if you're out scouting and, and you want, uh, you know, say in your garden or, or yard, and uh, you know, you really can't have a zero tolerance for the pests if, you're, if you want to have a, a biological control and kind of a natural system where you keep the pests suppressed to non-damaging level. And so if you're looking and you find aphids and you see these uh, ones that don't, aren't moving anymore and they're all kind of puffed out, these are what are called mummies. And so they've been attacked by uh, a non-stinging wasp. The, the aphids would disagree with that description because uh, they do sting the aphids. They insert an egg into their body and then their larva grows, uh, eats them from the inside out and will eventually pupate and change into adult form. And so uh, these things, uh, uh, this is another one that you can have in your high tunnels or greenhouses. And in some cases, what you, what you need to do to have sustaining populations is say you might have, uh, say you're trying to grow uh, tomatoes or peppers or something like that, you can have what are called banker plants of uh, say a grass and have uh, a type of aphid uh, established on there like the bird cherry oat aphid which won't attack your peppers or tomatoes but will provide a source of these things, you know, kind of a self-sustaining source of these. And then also uh, you know, having some flower resources because uh, um, most times the adults of these parasitoids will just visit flowers for nectar, for energy. Uh, and and, and uh, so that, you know, that's kind of the resource to, to, to mimic within your greenhouse or high tunnel a natural system where you've got uh, uh, you know, the, uh, everything that the parasitoid needs to complete its life cycle. And then it will spill over and attack any aphids that might be attacking your uh, particular valuable uh, garden plant. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Scott, one of the things about predators in your high tunnel, you really want to keep around the immature stages that are feeding on the pest. 
they're a whole lot easier to keep around than the adults because once they have wings, they have a tendency to fly away. They want to disperse if the if the food is not if their food is not prevalent anymore. So um, it's it's difficult to find that balance of how you keep these critters caged with their host long enough for them to lay eggs and allow larvae to develop. That's that's kind of critical when you're when you're using biological control agents. So Scott, if you're in the situation and say in a side of high tunnel where things have kind of gotten out of control and the natural predators might not be enough to suppress them, or you're outside where it's a little harder to use um, some of these particular tactics, what would you suggest folks do? Well, well there are, uh, you know, you can uh, uh, do a treatment first to uh, suppress uh, uh, the aphid population down to a point where then you could have an uh, introduction of the predators or parasitoids then help suppress the population. Uh, you just need to uh, utilize products that have, say, a short residual uh, so they won't affect uh, the introduction of your beneficials. Uh, you also want to uh, uh, look out for, uh, uh, say, in the case of uh, sometimes people will try to use carbaryl to suppress aphids. And it's carbaryl is really not in carbaryl was a long time uh, old insecticide that has been labeled for just about everything. Although it doesn't really do a very good job on aphids, it actually works. Uh, it's hotter on some of the aphid predators, like minute pirate bugs or something like that. Uh, and then the minute pirate bugs are usually what are suppressing your spider mites. And so you can have a flare of a different pest after you've done that. Uh, but uh, you can also, you know, you always, with integrated pest management, you always want to try to utilize uh, the least uh, toxic or hazardous product that will give you effective control. It doesn't do you any good to apply, you know, I, I, this, is, this product is really non-toxic, but if it doesn't give you control, what good does it do? So uh, again, you know, this is where it kind of it goes back to like Jeff's uh, uh, publication and provide some guidance on you know, what is efficacious and then how you can do that and, and then combine it because that's also what the integrated pest management is. You, you don't just rely, rely on an insecticide or a biological control. You look at all things that you can do, whether it's disrupting your habitat uh, uh, or you know, in, uh, doing some targeted uh, applications of insecticides and utilizing biological control. They're, they're not so there's some... I'm sorry, Scott, there's some soap-based products that you can use. Uh, there's horticultural oils that can be applied. Um, so there's, you know, there's a wide variety of tools that are available to you. It's just a lot of people don't know that they're available. So, I yeah. heard that you could spray them off if they're like outside on large ornamentals that can handle the force of some water spray. Is that effective? Well, that certainly can uh, suppress them. Uh, it, it, yeah. Uh, you know, that's like when I was talking about the cottonwood uh, uh, trees with the aphids up there. You get a year when you get a lot of severe thunderstorms and stuff, you, that really hurts their population. You'll know, wash them off. They aren't very, you know, that's, uh, they're not very rugged insects. Uh, that's why some of the species do that leaf curling. It provides them with physical protection from storm events. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you can wash them off and, and, and set them back that way. Yeah, I was going to mention when you showed that leaf curling that you, you can't, to me, a lot of times we see that leaf curling, that puckering of those leaves, and that can be also a symptom of a, a herbicide damage to those trees. But mm -hmm. we can't just make that assumption. We really need to understand because in that case, that's actually insects doing that damage. Um, so you can't get too angry at your neighbor that sprayed uh, on that case. So um yeah, no, and aphids, yeah, that it's hard. It, they're difficult to control. It's going to be multiple control measures and management to try and keep them under, under the populations you desire. Uh, but definitely a, a plethora of options to try and help mitigate them. So we had a question on spider mites for Scott. Um, they said they were having a lot of troubles with Scott, spider mites, so they wondered if you had some control options for those. I hate spider mites. <laughs> I guess we have a club for disliking them, but do you have some control <laughs> options? Well, yeah, spider mites uh, are difficult. Uh, 
the uh, you know there are natural controls you know like minute pirate bugs are ones there's actually some of the thrips and I was going to talk a little bit about a uh, uh, trip uh, predator because we have uh, you know, some of the um, uh, trips uh, are a type of very small insect most of them are you know, less than uh, 1.5 millimeters or uh, 125th of an inch uh, and and so but there are actually some of them that are beneficial they will attack uh, the uh, eggs of spider mites and help suppress them and, and in many cases uh, spider mites can also uh, be manipulated by uh, you know water they usually their populations are, will increase uh, in hot uh, dry dusty conditions that for some reason seems to favor them uh, and let them escape their natural uh, controls uh, so uh, again, also the products, you know, like uh, in Jeff's uh, uh, toolbox uh, publication, uh, you know, just because it's, you know, it's meant for high tunnels and greenhouses, uh, many of the products that he talks about in there, uh, if you look at the labels, can also be applied, um, you know, outside in a garden. Uh, you just always need to read the labels and, and, and check it out. But again, um, yeah. Spider mites are another one, really high reproductive rate. And then once you once they've escaped their natural controls or environmental conditions have become uh, uh, good for them, you know, they can be real problematic. Great. Anything you add to that, Jeff? I mean, it's like yeah, um, I got distracted by a comment. So um, uh, again, as you mentioned, mites really do well in hot, dry environments, which is perfect environment that you encounter inside of a high tunnel or a hoop house. So if you can manipulate the relative humidity to increase what is actually happening in there, that would help somewhat. I know in years where we have um, cooler, rainier seasons, I don't seem to have mites as a problem in my high tunnel. So um, it's just one of those things. And I think washing them off uh, and, um, uh, hort I've had fairly decent, uh, I wouldn't say control, I would say suppression, um, using horticultural oil on a fairly regular basis. So uh, it's one of those things you have to go back and apply and reapply. So um, there, there's, there are things there, you won't get them entirely under control unless the environmental conditions change to your benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, like I say, that's uh, uh, continual battle uh, with them in some cases. Uh, and and the, the one thing you also got to watch out, for, you know, the horticultural oils, um, some plants are, are can be sensitive to them or sensitive yeah. to them in hot, dry conditions. Uh, so it, it's like uh, catch-22 when the spider mites are worse. You, you want to watch and follow the guidance on applications so you don't get a leaf burn from uh, right. the horticultural oil. And they usually need to be diluted in water. They can't be a, they can't be applied straight on the plant. So it's important that you read the label that comes along with the product and understand how to apply them. Yeah, and and you gotta uh, generally it's best if you can do it a direct application. It's like there's no residual control. You need to, to get that onto either the insect, whether it's a aphid or a spider mite, in order to suffocate them. Essentially, is what you're doing. You're right. coating with that oil. Yeah. All right. Well, just one interesting aside, uh, you guys hadn't seen this uh, slide before, but this one is, uh, you know, the, the parasitoid wasp are fascinating. This is, uh, and we know so little about them, and, and this is one that attacks the eggs of thrips. And that, the thrips are those little tiny insects that are uh, only, you know, around a millimeter long. So even though they produce a pretty big egg for their size, that's a small insect. So this is the scale. This is a paramecium, this is an amoeba, and this is the adult of this megaphrygma uh, species of paras egg parasitoid. And so it attacks the egg. It inserts its egg into the egg of the thrip, and then it uh, completes its development in there. Uh, and then you also, in those uh, biological control uh, supply places, they will uh, also sell you trichogramma. Uh, uh, Trichogrammidae is the family of wasps that are specialists in eggs, uh, mainly of other insects. And, and so this is a, a great photo that I stole from, uh, uh, at least I gave her credit. Uh, uh, 
here's a dime. Here's the egg of a manduka a species of moth. I didn't know whether it's tom tomato or tobacco hornworm, but that you know, pretty good sized egg. That's a good size egg. Yeah. And 28 of these trichogramma uh, wasps emerge from that single egg. So wow. in some cases, you know, on a big egg, they can do, uh, uh, I think it's called polyembryony. So if they insert one egg in it, it's like a whole bunch of twins, I guess you could say. Uh, uh, so from one, one, one egg. But it just interesting, I, you know, just fascinating. And we don't even know you know its role you know, maybe that's the reason why you have a year oh boy the trips are really bad this year it's because we did something or environmental conditions were something that suppress their parasitism conversely yeah. you have a light year it's like hmm, you know where the trips go we're usually the first ones to mess things up <laughs> <laughs> leave it to humans to over control the control right that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> great what's next scott Ants and lawns. This this is one that oh. it, it always. Uh, I I kind of dread those. I I do yard calls sometimes, and uh, it's usually you know ants are destroying my lawn, and then I get there, and their lawn looks like my lawn. Like this is a picture from my lawn where it's a dry area, it's uh, you know, well drained. You can see it's kind of sandy soil, ideal for these little uh, ants that uh, generally we refer to them as field ants. They're usually ants in the genus. Formica, uh, uh, they can be you know, black or brown. Or some of them are, are, are reddish. Uh, uh, and they make these little mounds, and sometimes the mounds can get bigger. Uh, and and uh, generally, uh, if you look at lawns that are lush, they'll have fewer ants, but they still have ants because a lush lawn shades the ground and is less. Uh, uh, habitable to them. Uh, they like the kind of sparseness. I think they can get more heat and, and be more successful uh, uh, in, in the drier areas. Whereas if you know, we have a lush growing lawn, you know, they're still out and about. And they actually can be considered beneficial in many cases because the, the, the workers are out foraging and will attack many of the uh, actual plant feeding uh, uh, pest species of lawns. And so uh, again, uh, you know, generally, I recommend before you do a lot of uh, you know, spending money on ant control is to spend more money on proper water. You know, give that lawn uh, enough water to be able to grow lush. Uh, I often, you know, down, I, I, I take an old screwdriver I made into a, a kind of a demonstration moisture probe. And I'll go over to a downspout where there is some nice green lush grass there, stick it in, and then I walk out in the yard and it doesn't go in. And, and so, you know, it's a visual demonstration that, hey, you, you need to water the lawn. I need to water my lawn. I always think it's springtime and it should be green, but it's not. <laughs> well, and do you need to overseed it all or is it just watering, Scott? Well, I'm, I'm not a big, you know, as you can see from the picture in my lawn, I'm not really a, a, a great lawn person to ask, but I, I think usually in, in Wyoming, it's a, a lack of, of sufficient water. You know, you probably, during the growing season, you would need at least an inch of, of water per week, uh, whether you get that, uh, preferably in rain, but that's very rare in Wyoming. And uh, so you, you got to supply with irrigation. That's only if you've got turf if you've got trees and shrubs growing with your turf grass, then you got to add more water to supply both, or they're going to be competing and get thin. But you said these these. So what else do these ants do in this this environment? They're not necessarily harming the lawn. They're just maybe a, taking yeah, over a spot that is is to their benefit. They're just living. Jeremiah, they're just living. They're, just living. <laughs> they're yeah. not an actual pest. They're just living. Just let me be, right? Yeah. Well, you know, you get you get some areas. You know, say uh, if you, if you're living uh, uh, maybe near the edge of town or near uh, areas where are not developed, you can have spillover like harvest ants, which will clear off areas, and you know that's not a very good uh, situation to have in your lawn. 
uh, or you can have you know, even thatch ants growing up, uh, they'll make a mound near your fence or something like that, uh, make a mound. But these little uh, formica field ants, uh, they, they are not eating the, the plants. Uh, they are, uh, you know, again, they can be thought of as beneficial in a way to help with aeration and soil formation in the long-term view that we have. But of course, people, you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, having the mounds of blue spurt uh, is, is not very appealing in your lawn. Uh, so that's, that's why they get in trouble. Now, we do have some species that can uh, utilize uh, root aphids. Uh, the famous one is the corn uh, field ant and their relationship with the corn root age. Now, uh, that's very specific. There are some uh, others that, that, you know, the species in the genus Lazius, uh, which will, they treat the, the aphids like livestock. They protect them, they move them around, and uh, the picture here, you can see, uh, they'll go up and tap the aphids and get a drink of honeydew, you know, and, and so that's a, <laughs> Uh, in those cases, you know, if you've got uh, root aphids, uh, then they can, you know, they'll be stealing resources from your uh, plants. But generally, uh, they're considered, you know, the field ants do not do that. Uh, you know, their, their big uh, drawback is they make loose dirt mounds. So, Scott, it seems like I've seen this kind of farming type behavior on a little bali cherry that I had. And my understanding was that um, in order to help control the aphids, if you control the ants getting up into the tree or into the sh small shrub or tree, that you can help, con that'll help control the aphids because they're more open to predators. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. There are some of the species, uh, you know, that, that will tend ants up into plants. We'll, we'll protect them from the predators like, you know, the uh, lacewing larva and ladybird uh, larva and the parasitoids. Uh, like say, they treat them like their livestock. And so they're not gonna let predators into their livestock. So if you put a little like tanglefoot, which is a product that's really sticky, like around your bottom of your cherry tree, then it'll capture the ants so they can't go up and tend the aphids. And so you get better aphid control. Yeah, cool. yeah, the ants, they, you know, they'll, they'll be up in there and they'll be protecting and then they'll also be collecting the honeydew and then they'll be transporting that back down to the nest. And so if you can, you know, uh, like say put a barrier of that uh, around the plant, that will help interrupt it and, and uh, uh, you know, disrupt the ant protection that they're providing. So knowing the life cycle and what they're doing really helps with the controls often with the insect pests. Right. So we have a question for you, Scott. Uh, I have several large mounds of red ants. I call them fire ants and we'll be placing grass in that area. I don't want the kids playing in the area with these ants. How would you recommend getting rid of these? Yeah, uh, the uh, ants can be treated in those situations. Uh, I generally recommend baits uh, rather than say like a drench of stuff. Uh, the baits, is, uh, they are slow acting, uh, active ingredients that uh, because ants uh, feed through transfer of food from the you know, back and forth between members of the colony and the larva and eventually gets to the queen, which will eliminate it. If you, if you just do a spray of say a you know, product that's labeled uh, for your lawns, yeah, you'll kill workers, but all it does is actually stimulate the queen to produce more workers uh, for the colony, uh, so you don't get the long-term control. You, with those ones where they're like uh, the uh, essentially uh, a harvester ant, uh, they're usually in the genus Pogonomyrex, and and uh, so I would look for uh, ant bait that has harvester ants on it. A um, lot of times, ant baits can either be sweet or uh, uh, oil protein based. Uh, there are some products that do claim to uh, be universal. Uh, also, the size of the granules can be different. And so, uh, like say, if, if they have harvester ants specifically on the ant bait product, that should work fine to, uh, and give it some time because like say, it, it has to be slow. You, you have to get it transferred down into the colony and, and uh, uh, kill the queen and eventually the colony is, is destroyed before you. Uh, I would try when you say, 
I'm sorry to interrupt. When you say slow, how much time do you think that you would need? Because it looks like Dan wants to plant grass over the top of that area. Uh, well, that uh, I, it all depends on the product. You know, some of them like the Taro that has boric acid are, are, are relatively slow uh, mm -hmm. products as compared to one, say, uh, like the uh, uh, Amdro is yeah, fan, am, Amdro uh, hydromethylon or fipronil uh, with combat uh, baits. Uh, uh, so th those would be faster. Uh, you know the taro. Uh, you also have to watch that. You know, like uh, I went and did a yard call one time, and I had a great big bear spot, and uh, he said, "Well, I got rid of the ants there. I can't grow any grass." Well, it turned out he'd used like a whole box of uh, twenty mule team borax. Uh, and uh, it got, uh, he got ant control, but he also essentially, uh, uh, too much boron from the borax is uh, uh, toxic to the Toxin. Plants, so. <laughs> Oops. So, yeah, so you don't want to do that. Uh, uh, but like I say, it kind of depends on, on particular product uh, that you use. Uh, but uh, yeah. You, and a you, bit you, the you, size of the colony. Uh, yeah, some yeah. of those larger colonies can just take take a few weeks or a few months to, to really get under control. But uh, yeah, they're tough, but you got to get the, the, the poison and the bait down into the colony and kill off the larva and the queen or else they're just going to keep coming. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the thing about it. I mean, you know, there's lots of stuff out there about, you know, boiling water or, uh, you know, and for Pete's sakes, don't use, use motor oil or something like that to, to do this. You know, there's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a ridiculous in some cases, you know, people are so, I'm not going to use a product that's been labeled and is found to be safe when uh, used according to its label. I'm going to utilize something toxic like used motor oil. So, it's, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, it, you want to make sure that you got those harvester ants cleared out, you know, uh, completely before you try to replant. Otherwise, they'd just be back up chopping off your new seed seasonings. What about the diatomaceous earth? I heard that diatomaceous earth can kind of wreak havoc on ants and if you spread that around their their mounds. Does does that do anything for them? Well, you know, diatomaceous earth uh, can. Uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be transferred. Uh, you know, it'd be more like you're killing uh, the foragers going out. Uh, I, you know, I don't think it would be carried down and, and then transferred. It, you would certainly, you know, disrupt the foraging capability, but uh, you know the diatomaceous earth doesn't have a real long residual activity. Uh, maybe if you, you know, did applications long term, it's probably not the best option. Yeah, yeah, I don't think for that particular pest problem it would be a good uh, one to use. Right. So, what's our next uh, insect pest? Grasshoppers, my favorite. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so I'd Everybody's say you, favorite. You, you, you don't want to uh, wait until they're big to try to deal with them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, right now is a good time to be thinking about it because, well, actually, you know, depending on where you're at, in Laramie, you know, we're still, uh, my trees are barely leafed out, but in other parts of the state where you've actually got spring, uh, you might have had some of the grasshoppers starting to hatch. And so this is, this is when you want to treat them. You want to catch them early uh, when they hatch. And, and probably the big four that are problems in people's yards and gardens are, are these in the genus Melampus. Uh, so the migratory, the differential, two-striped, red-legged, they're, they're related to each other. They all have what I call the Nike swoosh. And, kind of that and, and there will be an exam after the program uh, based on actual size. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and they, these guys, yeah, that's the thing. You know, people don't realize that how how small they start out. You know, they 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 pay attention when they're you know inch and a half and, and uh, as big as your pinky, jumping around eating your your sweet corn. But when to get them is when they first start hatching, and they're about the size of a cooked grain of rice, uh, and they can hatch in tremendous numbers in very localized areas. So like the roadside ditches or. Uh, vacant lots back behind you know, sheds to get uh, you know an area that's gets weed with like ragweed and kochia and those types of things. You know those are, are excellent first 
food plants for these particular grasshoppers. Uh, you know, we have 120 different species of grasshoppers in Wyoming. Only about 12 of them are considered you know, pests. And of those, these are the ones that are big time you know, crop uh, and, and garden and yard pests. <clears throat> they have extended hatching period. So you can't just treat once and go, oh, I got them. No, you need to keep going out and checking and, and treating. You know, it depends on the product you use, like you use uh, uh, some of the grasshopper baits. Uh, uh, light treatments is, is uh, frequent because the baits, you know, they don't stay out there forever. And so it, it, you can keep suppressing that population uh, as they hatch. And they're so much easier to control when they're loose versus when they're great bait. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, so we had a comment in the, in the chat box that uh, a little point of humor that uh, an individual, her name is Annie, uh, her son in preschool won a duck and she was not too impressed when the duck came home. But however, over time, that duck ate all of her insect problems, especially grasshoppers. And so it wasn't too bad. Now the duck has a, a forever home, if you will, uh, just because of its, its best management ability. So, yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions, Scott. Uh, do you have anything, other comments or any other things that we didn't cover today to offer to people as, as they get going in this growing season, what to be watching for or, or what to, how to uh, bring that forward to help them uh, answer questions? Oh, well, uh, let me see here. I think I was going to, uh, there we go. I was going to recommend, uh, you know, I, I think uh, these two books are, are, um, should be on every gardener's shelf because they are, are really good. Uh, you know, this is a one, now it says Colorado, but for the first edition, it had the Rocky Mountain, Central Rocky Mountain State. So Wyoming is well covered with the insects and diseases of the woody plants there. It has a plant pest index. So you can utilize your knowledge of uh, the plant that you're seeing uh, and then the type of damage that you're seeing on it to really narrow down what the particular pest might be. And, and it's always identification of the pest, the first step in control. You've got to know what plant it's on and what it is in order to do any kind of uh, sensible management action. The other one, is, this is actually the first edition's cover. Uh, uh, Professor Whitney Cranshaw has the second edition out now. It, the first edition is a great book. You can get it used now. It has a plant pest index in it. The second edition is expanded and it's wonderful. Lots of, of great information and photos, but they, they ran out of time on getting the plant pest index. And so you can contact me because Whitney gave me the PDF of the plant pest index that goes with his new version. Uh, and uh, you know, he said that as soon as he sold 100 copies of that book, he's going to send me a dollar bill. It's my cut for, for promoting it. <laughs> Yeah. One dollar. You're, yeah, you're going to be rolling in it, Scott. Yeah, yeah. Pity a copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so I, th I think, you know, those two uh, are great resources. Uh, again, uh, online uh, information, uh, the High Plains IPM uh, web guide. Uh, I didn't put up the, uh, the official URL address of it because it's such a wacky one. Uh, but you can get on there and search for High Plains IPM website. And it is a consortium of uh, various state universities. It includes things like organic pesticides, protections of pollinators, integrated pest management, uh, horticulture, uh, you know, a lot of good information and also information about the particular pests that uh, is searchable. Um, so again, that's, uh, uh, and then like, like you said, Jeremiah, uh, if uh, people want uh, uh, some assistance on identification, um, you know, send me the best photos that they can. Uh, uh, by best, I mean clear focus. I don't care if they're a little dark or the color's not quite right. Uh, I can't tell much from blurry, but I can correct the other things. And, and so, and then what was the insect doing? Uh, or are, are they like the uh, uh, You know, was it on my tomatoes or uh, in my house, or whatever. So, uh, as much see, information as possible. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I've never, I've never said, oh, you provided way too much information. I, how can I possibly identify this insect? <laughs> uh, also, uh, you do accept um, uh, samples of insects, yes. and 
and I tell people that if they choose to send something in to either yourself or myself, we prefer that they haven't been flattened by a shoe or something else. They're a whole lot easier to identify if they're whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I still like to be contacted first, and 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 then we can go from there. Because sometimes, you know, if, if it's soft bodied or if it's still alive, or uh, I can give them uh, information on how to best get it to me uh, in one piece. Sure. Great. Well, we really appreciate it, Scott. I don't see any uh, lingering questions and, and that, and I think that was a great resource. Uh, and we'll, we'll try and link those resources up on the website and all that. So thank you so much for joining us. Jenny, Thanks, did you Scott. have anything? Just wanted to mention the folks that we have the Backyards and Barnards page where we put up a lot of different publications. So all you need to do is go to insects and then pull them up and we have a whole long section that's on pests. We also have some on grasshoppers and also on beneficial insects that folks might want to check out. And we'll be sure to have um, Jeff's publication up there after the show. Great. Yeah, and Jenny dropped that into the chat box here on the Zoom and I'm, I'm assuming she put that on Facebook as well, the link to that website. And so by all means, that, that Barnyards and Backyards website, we try and use it as a clearinghouse for all types of reference material and information. So it's at your fingertips. Reach out, uh, look up that website, find what information fits you uh, and what you're looking for. There's uh, numerous numbers of categories on there. Um, the other thing that we have on there is the Barnyards and Backyards live show. We have the schedule on there and we were just talking this morning. We are going to continue this show into June. We're going to try and shoot for once a week into June as things are getting busier with, with our uh, workload and that we're going to try and continue this effort. So check out that, uh, uh, that uh, schedule there. We also record them just like this show we we're recording. We'll get it edited and then post it back up on that website as well. So if you miss that, you can go back and review it again, or if you want to share it out. Also, we're trying to add those links that we talked about, those references or those, those good materials. And we try and put a link on there for you to get that directly uh, from what we talked about in the show. So please look up the Barnyards Backyards website. Uh, the other thing is, is as we talked about, uh, pest ID or ID in general is a big part of IPM. So if you have questions or need to help help with ID and pests, please contact Scott Shell through through that email, or you can reach out to your county extension office. So we have a, a local extension office in every county. Uh, please reach out to them, get to know them, and, and you can provide them samples and they can help you with getting those samples to Scott or answer questions and, and reach you and connect you down to Scott as well. So please reach out to your local extension office. We have one in every county and one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. The last part is, is we want to hear from you. As always, uh, we're doing the show on your behalf and so we want to make sure that we're doing an adequate job and we have uh, have an evaluation that's sent out. Jenny put that in the, the chat box here in the Zoom. And then on, on Facebook Live, there was uh, put it into the comments. So she uh, pro provided the links um, for you to provide that feedback. If you're in on Zoom, once you close out of your internet browser, uh, you'll be prompted in that internet browser for the evaluation. So if you have a few minutes, give us some feedback. We'd appreciate it. With that, again, Scott, thank you so much for joining us, providing us your information. We did not have enough time to get through all of the insects, uh, but maybe we can have you back again and, and do a few more. Uh, thank you, everyone. You guys have a great weekend and a good Friday. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. Bye. <laughs>